to give you some sort of inspirational speech where we're going to tell you how to live your best life. <laughs> maybe, maybe some prosperity gospel. Um, oh, geez, okay. So I have to confess that today I don't have slides. I know. I usually love to have slides. They're often very pretty. Um, oh, we're going to do one slide. Uh, the slides often are very beautiful because they're wonderful images from Wikimedia Commons. They often have pictures of you. Um, but today, I, ha I have no slides. And the reason I have no slides is that I spent most of my time preparing for this talk, trying to prepare the words that I wanted to say instead, um, instead of the images. So I was asked to give a talk for 30 minutes. We'll see if we get to 30. Um, if not, we'll just take up that time to come back together. I want to start by saying thank you all for being here and acknowledging those of us who are in the room. Um, there are 80 people here today from 43 countries with at least 20 languages represented. I think the number was 23, but in this community, it's hard to really know. There are uh, such a richness and diversity of, of folks in the room. Um, I wasn't able to get a specific statistic on gender parity, but looking around, I think we're, we're in a pretty good place. I'm impressed. 
And you all flew or walked or took a tram or took a train, say, here from all these 43 different countries. I am sure some of you are a little tired. Hands up if maybe you're feeling a little jet lagged. Anyone? I'm feeling a little jet lagged. Is anyone else feeling? We have Liang here in the future, in the front, looking extremely jet lagged. Okay, so four hours, that's it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, of course. These were long trips that you came on, and I want to thank you for coming on these trips because I think that this is an incredibly important event for us. It's the second diversity conference, uh, and I hope that it is. I hope that it is one of many yet to come. But I also hope that at some point there is a time and a place when we look around all of our conferences and they feel like the people here in this room. So. Why are we here? Um, well, because we are a community that inherently believes in the value that every single person has to offer. We are a community that inherently believes that every single person on the planet has something that they can share with us and with the world. And it's right there in our vision statement, right? A world in which every single person can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. And this is something that I have always found incredibly inspirational over the years because it does imply equity. It implies diversity. It implies that every single person has a role to play in our movement. And when they play that role in our movement, it is not something that is about consumption of knowledge. It is not just being passive users of Wikimedia projects or Wikipedia. It is about sharing back and having the presumption that their actions and their contributions are just as valuable as anybody else's. And yet, as this is our vision statement, we also have to recognize that it is not currently our reality. We know that. We know that just by the numbers. We know that as we look around our Wikimedia projects, that representation of gender is highly imbalanced. We know that representation geographically is highly imbalanced. Um, I'm reminded of the, and I said I didn't have slides, but you're gonna, I'm going to share some visuals, and I'm hoping I mean, you're all going to go to that space and you're going to imagine them. I'm reminded of the image um, from the researchers at the Oxford Internet Institute in which they drew a map around Europe, and they pointed out that the majority of the content on the Wikimedia projects all exists within that tiny circle, and the rest of the world has about as much representation as the density of Germany. I mean, that, that in and of itself underscores the problem. I'm reminded of the fact that of the languages that we speak in the Wikimedia projects, um, English remains the dominant in terms of the size of Wikipedia with 5.4-ish million articles, and that Arabic, and I, I speak of Arabic because I was just at Wiki Arabia the other day, Arabic, which is a language with 300 million speakers, give or take, 350, 250, depending on who you're, who's counting, has 500,000 articles. Certainly not representative of the number of speakers on the planet. And, and specifically, because we were reminded about this at Wiki Arabia, only 20% of those Arabic speakers speak a second language. So 80% of Arabic speakers have half a million articles on Wikipedia through which they experience the world. And then the other secret is, is that a lot of those articles are still about Europe. <laughs> it's true. Um, and so these are the issues of language, and they are issues of geography, and they are issues of gender, and we haven't even begun to speak to the issues of socioeconomic representation, where we know that the people in this room represent a certain amount of privilege, no matter co which community you come from. So we have challenges ahead. But the good news is that all of you flew across the world or walked or took a tram or took a train to be here because you believe in the importance of addressing these challenges. So why do we do what we do? What's the why? Um, what brings us all together? I know, you know we talk a lot about the fact that for some people it's about the edit count, but I'd, I suspect for all of us here in this room it's not just about the edit count. When we survey Wikimedians about why it is that they participate, time and again we get the same response. It's because people believe in the mission. It's because people believe in making free knowledge accessible to the world. We believe that the world is a better place when people have access to more free knowledge. You know, it's hard, I think, to capture exactly how every Wikimedian feels about this, and I don't want to speak on any of your behalf, but I can say, personally, 
that I believe is that the world is a better and more empowered place when more people have access to free knowledge and can participate in it. You know, I think that there is an implication there that we are stronger as communities, that we are more open as societies, that we have more empathy for each other when we understand where we come from and when we see ourselves fully represented. And when we see ourselves fully represented, we feel as though we have more of a place at the table to have these conversations. I believe also that it is about participation, as I mentioned, rather than consumption, that we as individuals and as citizens of the world are better off when we are active and empowered to shape the way that we want to vi view that world, that when we have access to information about the sciences and the arts, poetry and religion and geography, we live richer lives, richer lives in which we understand e each other better or in a better position to create more on our collective behalf. That's why I'm here. <laughs> um, and it, it seems to be that that's why many of our Wikimedians are here too, in whichever way they choose to articulate that. In the strategic direction, and, and we are going to talk a little bit more about that, and I'm going to try to stay light on the strategic direction today because we're going to have a lot of hours for it later. Um, the way that we captured this was talking about advancing humanity. Because a world in which every single human can freely share in the sum all of all knowledge is just a description of a state. It doesn't describe what it is that we're trying to achieve. But for me, at least, it's about achieving a place in which we are advancing humanity. And I want to start, not start, because I've already started, I want to acknowledge my own position being here in front of you all today. Um, I want to acknowledge the diversity or lack of diversity that I bring to my position. I am standing here in front of you as the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation, which is a position of extreme privilege within this movement. I am standing here as a, as a woman, yes, I will acknowledge that, but I'm also a neurotypical individual. I am a white individual. I am an individual from North America. I'm an individual who grew up speaking English as my native language, and despite all efforts to the otherwise, have failed completely to learn any others. Um, I am able-bodied. I was able to access tremendously good education as a young person. I never wanted for anything. My parents took care of me. All of these are pieces, positions of privilege that I bring to this position, and it means that I do not represent the diversity of the world which we serve, for the most part, other than that like 50% gender thing. Um, and so I say this because I want to put this out in front of you because I want to be reminded of it myself, and I want to be reminded of it in these conversations that I cannot do anything other than to listen the vast majority of the time when we are having conversations about the challenges that our communities face, and hopefully listen and be able to reflect back what I hear from you as how we may integrate those challenges into opportunities that we build going forward. I say it because if I don't acknowledge it, it sits within the room, and I want all of us to be able to freely acknowledge the different places that we come from and what that means. So I talked a little bit about why, how I understand the vision, but I also want to talk a little bit about why I understand the promise of Wikimedia. Um, three, four, almost four years ago, I joined the Wikimedia Foundation. And the reason for me that brought me to the Wikimedia Foundation, one of the things that I found so com incredibly different about this particular movement was the commitment to shared power in our communities. Now, we all know that that shared power promise has waxed and waned over the years. Sometimes we have been better at it, and sometimes we have not been so good. Uh, but nonetheless, there was a commitment within this idea of Wikimedia that nobody owns Wikimedia, that it is owned by the communities who create it, and that it is owned by the world itself. And I had spent a lot of time working in other organizations that were all about reaching out to communities and serving communities and trying to build target populations of communities who were going to be beneficiaries of the programs um, that we sought to build. It traditional nonprofit organizations. And I think the, the problematic aspect of, there is, of that is right there in the language. When you're talking about target populations, it makes it sound like you're going on a hunt, right? Um, these, there's something inherently problematic in the idea that any one person would design for any other person what a solution to their community 
challenges might be. And what Wikimedia promised instead, and as I said, it has been an imperfect promise that we have plenty of opportunity to continue to live up to in our future, is that instead of having target populations, that we were all in it together. That we as a community determined who we wanted to be, how we wanted to evolve, where our projects were going to go, and what the needs were that we had, and how we were going to address them. How we were going to bring our resources together, and how we were going to allocate our resources. And that is something I have truly never seen at a global scale. I know that that happens in communities, I know that that happens within countries, but to see that at a global scale is such an aspirational promise. And it feels like a promise that I think we're all here today to honor in this room. So, oh, nope, going back. All right. So arguably, and I asked, our, I said, are we, are we there yet, right? Um, arguably, no, we're not. I mean, I think, as I said at the beginning, it's really clear that we're not there yet um, in terms of the way that our content and the way that our knowledge reflects the world. Are we there yet in terms of the promise of shared power of our communities? I think the answer is also no, we're not quite there yet. Um, have we changed the world? <laughs> yes, I think we have. And um, I was going to give some examples of why we've changed the world, but I would rather go to you. Someone who just said yes, how have we changed the world? What's that? Free access to knowledge? Access to Wikipedia and uh, to no PowerPoint. <laughs> and they upload article and picture from Wikipedia and it's eight years old. So this is great. That's incredible. Eight yeah. years old. Wow, that's our future. Yes. Others? A lot of students use Wikipedia, copy from Wikipedia. So <laughs> a lot of <laughs> theses are done with Wikipedia. So. <laughs> We really raised the bar on what knowledge should look like because you said that just three, uh, 900,000 articles is a few. <laughs> and this is uh, a different perspective that we uh, built. That is very true. Well, well pointed out. <laughs> One thing that I'm very proud of is that we've increased the level of source criticism in the world because Wikipedia can't be trusted and you shouldn't trust it. And we've taught people that. So critical, critical reading skills, digital and yeah. media literacy, okay. And I'm really excited uh, to see how the community grows uh, uh, regardless of the age and uh, the, the the background of the 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 member, I mean there are young people, really young people, uh, become the administrator uh, of Wikipedia uh, in Chinese Wikipedia, and uh, uh, they're like they're even like half of my age, <laughs> and they're doing this administrative work so well and so calmly to defeat all the bully and uh, all the, uh, uh, the, 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 the the internet troll. And that's the empowerment spirit that I'm most thrilled about. And I can talk to uh, people from the men in China, which we are still in the civil war state. <laughs> 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 all right, so, so cross-border collaboration and youth empowerment. These are, these are some good answers here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I think that Wikimedia has changed the world. I think there's a lot more world changing that we can do, but certainly in the sense of the whole model of what a collaborative community could look like, the whole idea that information could be free at all, um, the fact that the data and the knowledge base of Wikipedia is used not just to inform people, but to draw insights about the world around us and to build 
uh, new technologies. Uh, you know, Wikipedia is data and it's the corpus is something that is used throughout technical communities all over the world. It's such good chance that something you touch when you go and use something like a, um, you know, Google Translate has been trained in some way on Wikipedia data. You know, our impact on the world at this point is so profound that if we were, if Wikipedia were not to exist, I actually don't know how any of us would function. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to make light of this in any way, but I travel, I was just sitting in Turkey the other day on a layover. And as we know, you can't access Wikipedia. Is anyone here from Turkey in the room? Do you have a Turkish group? You too? Okay. okay. <laughs> but you're not in mainland Turkey. So, or mainland, you're not in Turkey. Um, and to not be able to access Wikipedia for t you know, 15 minutes of sitting down reminds you of what it feels like when you've lost a part of your brain. Um, and so, you know, it, uh, to my way of thinking, it certainly is something where we have changed the world. And yet, as I've said, we haven't changed it enough, right? How is it possible that today, among amidst our well-known challenges with gender, I received somebody sending me a link the other day to an RFA from a woman who the responses were, I don't know if I can trust you as an admin because you care so much about this gender thing. I don't know if you can be fair. <sighs> you know, how is it possible that we're still talking about a gender gap when gender is something that is far more fluid than two sides of a discussion? You know, how is it possible that of our 70,000 or so active contributors on a monthly basis, 50% of those contribute to English Wikipedia, which means that only 50% of those 70,000 contribute to all the other projects in the world. How is it possible that we have only one chapter in Africa? Right? How is it possible that I'm standing here speaking to you in English and we do not have simultaneous translation? Now, when I say some of these things, I know it's possible because is if in at the foundation and in a position of power and privilege, we have not taken the necessary steps to address some of these issues. But I also know that it's possible because we as a community and as a movement are not as fully and truly diverse and inclusive as we wish to be. I raise them because they underscore the challenges for us ahead and they make it clear to us how much work that we have to do. And I raise them because naming these issues is a form of accountability. If we put these issues out in front of us, and you have been putting these issues out for years, I don't mean to say that like these are isu issues, mm, issues that I alone know. I know these issues because they are the issues that you raise. But these are issues, uh, by raising these issues, it's a form of accountability to ourselves. Um, but I should take pains to clarify, it is also not a burden for those of us in the room to take on alone. I was reminded of the expression or the saying that, you know, it is not for the marginalized to remedy the problem because they did not build it. And I found that particular, I knew that there was an expression to that effect. And I want to just acknowledge that that particular phrasing comes from a um, woman named Ava DuVernay, who is a, uh, yep, there's some nods in the room, yes, a uh, black American female filmmaker and artist uh, and just all around awesome human. Um, so if it is not for those of us in the room, if it is not for the marginalized to remedy the problem because they did not build it, what is it that we can do? Well, first, we can build community among ourselves and among each other. We can find places of power in that community. We can find places to have this open conversation in these communities. We can, through the power of community, have a stronger voice in the broader community. But we can also think about what are the frameworks through which we raise these issues to the community as a whole, and how do the way does the work that we do integrate into the work of the broader movement? So earlier this week, I went to a conference in Chicago. Uh, it was hosted by the Obama Foundation, and the focus of the conference was really around organizing and community building. And I went to a specific session uh, led by another really incredible, powerful black American woman named Brittany Packnett, who is an organizer at an organization called Teach for America in the United States. And I'm specifically telling you this because I want to recognize the work that other people do. And I want to put names to the work that other people do because it is important that as other people do this work to raise awareness around the challenges that we face, that we name and acknowledge them for the work that they do. So 
this woman, Brittany, she's a she's a leader in this educational nonprofit in the United States. It's called Teach for America, and she led a session on equity and inclusion. And I want to share. I found her words so powerful, and I found the ideas uh, re so resonated with me coming into the room today that I'm just borrowing them with attribution and sharing them with you. Um, so. I think the first thing is, despite the name of our conference today, which is the Wikimedia Diversity Conference, diversity is not the end state, right? Diversity is the people in the room. Diversity is what we represent collectively. But diversity is not the end state that we're looking for. Um, inclusion is not even the end state. The end state is a form of equity. The end state is a form of equity in which all of us find ourselves equal in front of each other with access to the resources we need to be able to do our work. And so this, so Brittany started this session the other day by asking who in the room had ever experienced equity? And I'm gonna ask the same question of you. Who in this room has ever experienced a state of equity? Raise your hands if you have. Ah, uh, so you knew I was asking you to raise your hands, and yet not a single hand went up. Okay. Who among you in this room has ever been in a place or a time or a community in which you fully felt that all aspects of yourself were included, were represented, that you had voice and agency and power. Okay, so one hand. A couple more hands, great. So that, but still a very few number of hands. And the reason I raise this is because what we are asking ourselves to get to, a place where all of us feel included, that every aspect of ourselves is represented, that we have voice and agency and power in decision making and in our communities, this is not a place where many of us have ever felt that we have been before. And the reason why this matters is because if we do not know what it feels like to be there, it is very hard for us to map the journey to get us there as a community. We're asking ourselves to take on work around diversity and inclusion and equity when we as a society and as a world have very little experience being in that place. And since we have little experience being in that place, it is hard for us to know how exactly we get from where we are today to that place of inclusion and representation. Does that make more sense? Okay, just checking. Thank you, Victoria, for asking the question. So to give some additional context. I, I use the language of equity, and I'm going to speak a little bit more about this because it's something that we're going to talk about a lot this afternoon because it's in the language of the, of the strategic direction. And I explicitly want to define this not because I assume you don't know what this is, but because I have been asked the question of what does equity mean and how is it different than equality, for example. And I recognize that in doing this, I am again taking advantage of the fact that as an English speaker, these distinctions mean quite a lot to me. And so conceptually, I think it's important to be able to have clarity around what these different words mean and why we're using them specifically. So I think everyone here is more familiar with the concept of equality, right? That we are all equals in front of each other in this room. That what we bring into this room is of equal value and importance as to anybody else brings into this room. But we all have different challenges in our work. The challenge of a community working with, a, with limited electricity is a very different challenge than a community working under political pressure. These are different challenges that we have in our work. And all of these challenges are equal and valid challenges, but they are different challenges. And if I gave you equal solutions to address these challenges, even if they were totally equal person to person, we wouldn't all get to the same end point because different challenges require different solutions. So equality itself is not enough. What instead we need is access to the resources and capacity 
to reach equal solutions, but recognizing that those resources and capacities might be different. We need access to different tools to achieve equal outcomes. And that is the concept of equity, that each among us starts from a position of being equals in front of each other, and that we are each trying to reach a position in which we remain equals in front of each other, in which we are all equals in front of each other. But the differences in terms of what we will need to achieve that and go on that journey are differences of equity. Does that resonate with the room? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry, um, not to interrupt your talk, Catherine, but no, this no. Cool if I had had slides, it would have been on um, here. <laughs> with equality, and it's got three different, um, sorry, three things, plinths the same size, and like the tall guy can see the football game and the, the toddler can't, and with equity, it's, it's, sort of the redistrib it's the redistribution of those same blocks, which I think is the important thing. Thank you, Lucy. Sorry. So I in that image, the idea is that the children are standing behind a fence. And then and they you remove the fence. See. And so you give them boxes so that the shorter child can see above the fence. So that, that's all nice and good. But then there's another extension of that comic where they take away the fence entirely. And that's saying, OK, here we're actually destroying what was causing the inequality in the first place. Yes. How do we change the this, this structural challenges? So I wanted to say to talk a little bit about this concept of equity because I think it, it requires that we all have access to different paths and resources to achieve equal ends. And that I think is the core of what the work is ahead of us, particularly as we go into the afternoon's conversation around the strategic direction. When we talk about knowledge equity as one of the goals of the strategic direction for the movement, what we are talking about is not that everything is equal for all of us, but that we are going to each require different ways of doing the work in order to achieve our goals. And the reason I think this is important in this conversation is that diversity and the conversation we're having today at Diversity Conference is recognizing that diversity is actually only the first step to equity. That we need to start with diversity in terms of having a diverse group of people represented in the room who represent diverse communities of people with different needs and different challenges and different lived experiences, but that it is not a lot enough alone to bring everyone into the room, that we then need to also be able to achieve a form of inclusion where people feel as though they're not just in the room but have a seat at the table. It doesn't matter if we have a diverse group of people if half of that room is in the back and only those people who feel empowered to speak are able to speak. Everyone needs to feel welcome. Everyone needs to feel empowered. Everyone needs to have a sense that their voices are heard and have understanding of how those voices are being heard and how their perspectives and their experiences are being used to make decisions. And then, if we're successful in that, we may get to a place of being able to have a conversation around equity. So what does the strategic direction itself actually say around knowledge equity? It says that as a social movement, we will focus our efforts on the knowledge and communities that have been left out by structures of power and privilege. We will welcome people from every background to build strong and diverse communities. And we will break down the social, political, and technical barriers preventing people from accessing and contributing to free knowledge. Has everyone read that? Some, some nods, some not yet. All right, that's OK. By the time we leave this room today, you are going to know it like whew, back of your head. Um, and so that's the goal, right? We're to be able to really think about how do we include those who have not been included? How do we break down these barriers? Perhaps it's how do we remove the fence, as you just heard? How do we ensure that those challenges that you have are represented? How do we ensure that our communities themselves as the Wikimedia movement are more representative of the communities that we seek to serve? And as we go into today's session, I'm going to use some, con I want to introduce some concepts that I think might be useful. And I will put these up on Wiki. Um, apologies, because I know that sharing information without visual information can be challenging, and I do apologize for that. The concepts of shared power decentralization of dominant culture, cultivating identity, 
accessible language and centering the marginalized. And these are five steps in the process or the journey from diversity to inclusion to equity that I think are very powerful tools that we should be using throughout this conference to ask ourselves, are we getting what we need out of this conference? Are others getting what they need out of this conference? Does this conference become a, the basis for further conversations and further work throughout the movement? And so what do those concepts themselves mean? So shared power is something we talk a lot about in the Wikimedia movement, but just a reminder that shared power is this idea that those who for whom a solution is being created are involved in the process of creating it. Shared power means, to borrow another expression, nothing about us without us. So if there is something that affects us, we are in the room to discuss it that we all have that seat at the table and our voices are involved and incorporated into decision making. The other one, the next one is this idea of decentralizing dominant culture. So another way of thinking about this is, like, is there a single archetype or model of what success looks like or what include or what value looks like in the Wikimedia movement? And I often think of this as the edit count question. How much does your edit count determine how much value you bring to the movement. We talked about this a little bit at the Wikimedia CEE conference in Warsaw recently, this idea that for many people who contribute to a Wikimedia movement, they contribute in other ways than their edit count. They contribute in organizing, they contribute in advocacy, they contribute in doing emotional labor of keeping people collaborative and working together. They contribute in bringing partners into the movement they contribute in explaining what it is that we do. They contribute in many different ways that are not just the edit count. But at the end of the day, in many discussions, the edit count remains the only thing that matters. That is dominant culture. And that dominant culture is something that if you are sitting there with a laptop in front of you that you own, with electricity that never fails, and cheap internet, and access to all of the resources that you need through your libraries or your other institutions, it is a lot easier to rack up a really large edit count than if what you are doing is bringing people together to talk about the importance of free knowledge. Or if what you are doing is sitting down with an administrator in a university and explaining why Wikipedia is something they should be using. Dominant culture is something that privileges the edit count above all others, but it also inherently means that we are saying that this thing that people can do because they have access to all these other resources is more important than the work that people who do not have access to these other resources and are doing this work anyway, it's more important than their work. And so when we think about decentralizing dominant culture in the Wikimedia movement, what I think we really are thinking about is how do we find ways to celebrate all the contributions that we're making? Cultivating identity. This is another one that we struggle with a little bit, where there is a certain way to be a Wikimedian, and that way to be a Wikimedian might be the way of being a North American Wikimedian, or it might be the way of being a European Wikimedian, and not fully recognizing that there are other ways to be Wikimedians and that your identity and culture is as valued, and not only as valued, but brings value in and of itself into the room. And so if you are an African Wikimedian or a Latin American Wikimedian, that, you sh that culture and that identity is celebrated in a way that the community says this in and of itself has value. That we want to cultivate a diversity of people in our rooms and in our spaces, and that it's not just about sort of saying, it's great that all these people speak these different languages, but saying we bring value in that people do. The last two, and then we'll wrap up, are accessible language. I've failed at this already in this presentation. Speaking in ways that our communities understand. Speaking in language that you and I have a clear understanding about what it is that we're talking about so that we can have the basis of a good conversation. Regardless of what language we speak, all Wikimedians love language. We like to be precise. 
<laughs> we like to be very specific <laughs> about what we mean. Unfortunately, it doesn't always mean that we are accessible. And so how do we, as we go into these, these conversations, remain accessible to one another? And finally, this idea of center centralizing the marginalized, which means that how do we ensure that when we bring people together into the room, that we're not doing so in a way that tokenizes their participation, or another way of saying that, how do we do so in a way that says, your challenges, those of you who have been left out structurally throughout societies, not just in the Wikimedia movement, that we will listen to you first, and we will listen to the needs of those who have always had a lot of power in the Wikimedia movement after we listen to those who have often not had power in the Wikimedia movement. So those five things around shared power, decentralizing the dominant culture, cultivating diverse identities, speaking in an accessible and easily understood way using accessible language, and centralizing the mar centering the marginalized. I think if we can think about those five things as we go into the conversations here today, and as we bring those conversations to the rest of our communities, that's a really strong place for us to come from. Okay, we're almost done. The last thought I want to leave you with is that you are all radicals. <laughs> you are radicals because you are here in this room, right? You are radicals because you are representing communities that are underrepresented in this movement to get from the beginning. But you are also radicals because this movement is a radical movement. This movement is a group of radical people because free knowledge in and of itself, and you've heard me say this before, but free knowledge is a radical act. And I know it doesn't always feel like that when we sit there and we're adding our citations and perhaps we're just fighting over what does this one word mean in this one sentence. But free knowledge is a fundamentally radical thing for us to do, right? Because for centuries, knowledge has been a tool of power. For centuries, it has been used to build empires, to build empires of religion, empires of political power, empires of capital. When you say that free knowledge should exist and that everyone should be able to participate in it and everyone should be able to access it, that is going against centuries, if not millennia, of human instincts, of aggregate power, of, the, of exclusion. And so what you are doing in this room today, what we are doing in this room, what we do every single day is radical. And I just want to acknowledge that. Because there's a lot of power in that, but there's also a lot of pressure in that. And so like, let's just take the pressure off for a moment. Let's sit here in the sense that we are a community of radicals. Let's acknowledge the challenges that we have. Let's, un let's center, again, uh, center again around the idea that what we are doing is a form of justice, and that justice is hard, and that justice is a struggle and that this is a safe space for us to be having those conversations over the next 24 hours while we're here together. Because these conversations are hard, and justice is difficult, and it is a process, and what we are doing is part of a process. So I want to say thank you very much for all of your works performing radical acts of justice every single day, um, and have a, we're going to have a great conference. Thanks. Thank you, Catherine.